was there any justification to Hitler's reasons mm -hmm. for looking at the Jewish population as a Weltfeind or an enemy of the world? Yes. Uh, Hitler, he uses these interesting expressions as enemy of the world. And uh, these are ex expressions, actually, you can uh, see come from his study of the Jewish question through history. You find similar phrases, in, in fact, in uh, ancient uh, Greek and Roman sources. Uh, Seneca, as we all know, if we read St. Augustine, his uh, Kivitas De Kivitate Dei, uh, says 611 perhaps, uh, that uh, Seneca called the Jews for the Sceleratissim Agents, the most criminal people on earth. So there was this long tradition of anti-Semitism, and Hitler was convinced that this was true, and so he just uh, he said it very, very clearly, either it's them or it's us. So he reacted against what he saw as an uh, enemy to whom you could not talk. Either this enemy won the war or the Europeans won the war. And therefore it's a totally ununderstandable, unintelligible why anyone would deny that Hitler, when he had the chance, actually did what he could. In regard to the claim of Jewish Bolshevism, is that based in fact or is that based only in Hitler's mind? That then is an entirely different question. But an important one if we are to understand. Undoubtedly a very important question. And it has been taken up recently by several authors, German as well as non-German. and. Uh, I don't think anyone would deny today that there is a concept like Stalin's willing executioners. There was an overwhelming number of Jews involved in Bolshevism. That was one reason why not just Jews, but also gypsies, as, as, Asiatic uh, Untermenschen, uh, Minderwertige, as well as uh, communist commissars were to be shot. Hitler saw this as a struggle against Bolshevism. Uh, including Jews. When common Jews had to be killed, it was because they, from a racial uh, point of view, uh, formed the reservoir, the basis, the biological basis of future Bolshevism. So for Hitler, uh, the Jews were simply a, a race to be exterminated, like, um, like, uh, like a pest, uh, like parasites. Uh, this was I wonder if he ever doubted this. This was simply a conviction of his, and it was widespread conviction of his. And so he took harsh measures, and um, these we seldom hear from so-called revisionists. We don't hear much about Jewish Bolshevism. Recently a German scholar, <laughs> who is certainly not an anti-Semite, von Bieberstein, has published an interesting book, Jüdischer Bolshevismus, Jewish Bolshevism, a myth or reality. A very, very carefully researched uh, a book that uh, created some, some uh, attention in Germany. And he points out that it's partly a myth, partly reality of this Jewish Bolshevism. And in this connection, I'm glad you reminded me, there is a German scholar, Ernst Nolte. And he argued very well, correct as I th would think, that we really have to understand that Hitler was very anti-Jewish and very anti-Bolshevik. And that's the reason for his harsh measures that we have been talking about. So, to a large extent, Hitler's brutal war against the Jews is to be understood as a reaction to what one could, what Europeans had experienced since 1917. Uh, one needs to read carefully, when one is interested in the Holocaust issue, the well-known work that appeared some years ago, been translated into various modern languages, um, the Black Book of uh, Communism. The first chapter, a state against, against its own people. A state against its own people a state against its own people. That seems to be a rather criminal 
affair. It's a long story of the tragedy of Russia, also of the Ukrainians, the white Russians and so on, on the Bolshevik regime. Uh, just one among the many cases would be the starvation imposed upon the Ukrainians in 32-33. It's often called, with a more modern expression, the Horo de Mor. Horo de Mor. Our dictionaries don't even have an entry on Holo de Mor. Seven to ten million Ukrainians were forced to death through deliberate starvation imposed upon by the Soviet Bolshevik regime. Unfortunately, many Jewish names occur in this connection. Kaganovich, Epstein, Beria, and so on and so forth. Hitler looked at it in this perspective and he thought, well, it's not, it's not a very happy situation if the same is going to happen to Europe. And so he thought he, this was very clear, that uh, Bolshevism must be exterminated and Bolshevism must be, in order to exterminate Bolshevism, you must exterminate the Jews because they were a fundamental part of, of, um, of Bolshevism. Of course, it wouldn't have imply his, his argument wouldn't work so well when we're dealing with China and Cambodia, Wanda and other cases of what has been called, more or less correctly, genocide. It's a, therefore very right and correct of Nolte to say that we must compare the two genocides, the huge one, the very huge one of the Bolsheviks and the one of Hitler, which even though the numbers can be really are obscure, as I explained, still is much smaller, but it, there are many parallels, so we must compare. And you would think it's very natural to compare, because then we, if, we want to, if we want to avoid massacres and mass murders and genocide in the future, we want to understand why they took place. And one way to understand is to compare. It's very helpful to compare similar uh, phenomena. But there from the point of view of Holocaust religion, all religions more or less claim that they are unique. For the Buddhists, it's the Buddha. For the Christians, it's a Christ. And in this case, we must, we learn from spokesmen of Jewish organizations, we must not compare the Holocaust with the whole of the more, for instance. The Holocaust, they say, is unique. Yes, Unique, just like Jesus Christ would be unique, just like the Buddha would be unique, and so on and so forth. But, from a historical point of view, human beings are human beings. So when you make the claim that the, the murder of many, not really the murder of, but the many murders of Jewish groups is unique, it doesn't, it only makes sense for a religious mind, not for a rational historical mind, because from that point of view, a human being is a human being. There's nothing closer. It's not the case that a Jewish woman or a Jewish man or a Jewish child is closer to God than a Tibetan man, a Tibetan woman, a Cambodian child. See? That doesn't make sense from a historian's point of view, but it does make sense from leading Jewish spokesmen. So you're in a fix saying that one of the characteristics of this Holocaust religion is Jewish ethnocentrism, racism? Uh, Professor MacDonald uses the term ethnocentrism, meaning that you center, that you are very much concerned with your own ethnos, your own people. And uh, if you say that the murder of a Jew is worse than the murder of a Tibetan, or of a Russian, or of a Ukrainian, I cannot. I cannot understand this, unless I assume, as many do, that a Jewish person is closer to God, it's superhuman, whereas the others are subhumans. Otherwise the statement, I cannot see how the statement makes sense, that the murder of a Jew is more, 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 it's criminal, but it's more criminal than the murder of a Ukrainian peasant. Only makes sense. If the Jew is closer to God, almost like a God, otherwise it doesn't make sense. 
it's okay as a religious belief, but it's one that is not intelligible on rational uh, terms. Thank you. 